for the break. Now we know uh, we know error back propagation. We know how can we implement it step by step. We know what is momentum term, for example. How can we implement it? And now we need to go into the second part. Uh, we need to know the difference. I mean, what what I mean, what working with unlabeled data, right? How can we work with unlabeled data? I mean, in MNIST data set, for example, it's labeled data. So we have some digits, we have some pictures, uh, and we have someone who has been labeling it. For example, he just said, okay, this is zero, this is one, two, three, four. And this is how we build our uh, data set. And we can use this data set, label the data set for building a supervised machine learning model. But in reality, the majority of the data around us, it's unlabeled. So most of the data around us, it's unlabeled. And, and, uh, and the unsupervised machine learning models, it's uh, the kind of tools or the machine learning uh, section which deals with unlabeled data analysis. So first we need to compare between supervised and unsupervised learning. So the field of machine learning has two major, major branches, hmm. supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning labels are available, which can be used to measure and improve its performance on some tasks through a cost function. So, I mean, the cost function, which we mentioned, I mean, we have this kind of cost function. So we have this E equal half multiplied by the summation of T minus Y squared. This is the cost function or the loss function, which we try to minimize. So this cost function, in fact, it's function of the target values. Do you see this one? This T, it's the labels. So all time we try to minimize the difference between our predicted label and our target label. And we use this error function for adjusting the weights. So in supervised learning labels are available, which can be used to measure and improve the performance on some tasks through a cost function. So this cost function, we can use it to calculate prediction error. And we can just, uh, from this number, we can just say if our model is good or bad. In unsupervised learning, labels are not available. We don't have such kind of labels. And the task of the AI is not well-defined and the performance cannot be uh, measured, in fact. So if it is labeled, we can just have this cost function. We can use error back propagation. We can use gradient descent to adjust the weights in a way to minimize this cost function or this loss function. But in case of unsupervised, in case of unsupervised, we don't have the, those labels. So we, we don't have this kind of function, in fact. We don't have this kind of uh, function. So the task in, in unsupervised learning, it's not well-defined. And the performance also, it's not easy to measure the performance of your model. If we need to measure the performance, we will run some examples today where we measure the performance using a labeled set. So we have a data set. We will train it. Uh, we, we will use this data for training an unsupervised model, and we will check the performance using the labels. But in reality, in, in unsupervised learning, we don't have labels. We don't have any kind of cost functions which can help us to measure the performance of our model. Unsupervised learning problem is less clearly defined than the supervised learning problem and hard to solve, in fact. But if handled well, the solution is more powerful. So I can, I can, I can give you an example. Do you know, uh, I don't know how, uh, uh, for example, when you upload any picture, for example, in your Facebook account or in uh, Google account, uh, they can tag the faces of the people in the, each image. So they can classify, I mean, they can classify. So if you uploaded some images, for example, I mean, uh, it will start tagging those faces using a bounding box. And, um, and it will tag the same person on all images. And once you give it a label, so if you go to one of those pictures and just give a label or a title to one of those uh, bounding box, uh, the machine will be able to recognize the same face in all other images, and it will just give him the same label, right? So it's, un it's, it's unsupervised learning. Also in your email, for example, when you are getting an email, the spam from somewhere, for example, and you can just uh, uh, mark it as a spam, it will go to the spam uh, folder, for example, and you will not be able to get those kind of emails later on. So you teach the machine, in fact. So the machine will classify it as a spam later on. 
so unsupervised the system is better than the supervised the system at finding a new patterns in future data and making the unsupervised solution more uh, nimble on a go forward basis. I mean, when we build a machine learning using unsupervised learning, it's, it should be most, more smart, in fact. Because when we design a problem, for example, when we build a model to classify MNIST dataset, I mean, MNIST dataset, it's very well defined. We have some features, we have some classes, and we need to build a model which can classify those images into two, one of those 10 classes. So the problem is well defined, and it's easy really to build a good solution for it. But maybe if you got some new images, uh, by other people, they write in some house, they kids, for example, maybe the machine will not be able to generalize and classify them, for example. Um, so, for example, if you're building a machine to classify um, letters, for example, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, uh, but, but um, suddenly someone is just using Danish letters or Norwegian letters, just O, for example, or O, and so it would be impossible for, for supervised learning to classify the new one. But if it is unsupervised, it, it will detect that we have a new class, in fact. We have a new class. And it will, it will ask the user, in fact, it will, it will um, ask the user to just to give it a label. So it will discover that we have a new class and we need to give it a label. So supervised learning, in fact, um, we measure the performance in supervised learning. AI trains on a data where it measures its performance using a cost function by comparing its predicted image label with the true image label. Labels guide the machine learning model or the AI agent by providing it with an error measure. So we have this error measure or this loss function and this loss function will guide my model. The AI uses the error measure to improve the performance over time. Without such labels, the AI does not know how successful it is or not in correctly classifying images. So without this error function or loss function, the model will not be able to understand if it's going, if it's doing well or doing bad in fact. However, the cost of manually labeling an image, uh, an image data set are high. I mean, the cost is very high. We had a bachelor project before where uh, students as they have been working with the start in Vivasan for classifying images of roads and they try to de detect the cracks in roads, for example. So in, in a certain by Boston, I mean in Norway, they scan roads two times per year, and they have millions and millions of kilometers of images of roads. They have two cars or several cars, and those cars are just a scan on roads on the way. They are keep driving and the scanning and the storing those images in the cloud. And then when uh, someone reports that we have a damage in some part of the road, for example, they go to that specific place and they check it and they start maintenance process. So I have been working with those students, I mean, two years ago, and we developed a machine learning model for predictive maintenance of, uh, of roads using deep learning. And uh, we developed some, um, some tools uh, to, to predict the remaining useful life of roads and we can visualize it in a map. So the idea here is to, um, but, but, but we had a problem because we have lots of images. We have millions and millions of kilometers of images. I mean, they scan it for 14 years or 20 years. So they have lots of data sets, but all those data sets are unlabeled in fact. When it's unlabeled, you cannot go for supervised learning. If you want to go for supervised learning, you need to get someone to label it. So in fact, we build our data set for training our models. So we got some images. I guess uh, for the route, maybe from Trondheim to Olsson, and students, they have been sitting together and labeling it. So they try when they see a crack, they just mark it and so on in all images. And after that, we use those images for uh, training the machine learning model. So the machine learning will be able to do the same task, repeat it. So the best known image data sets have only thousands of labels, which might not enough for training some systems. If you want to go for deep learning, for example, Maybe a few thousand of images, images it, it's not enough. You need more and more. So in fact, it's costly to develop supervised machine learning models. It's expensive. And, and not only expensive, it's expensive and also it's, it's well-defined the problem. When it's well-defined, it will be working fine in this narrow domain. But if you want to uh, extend it to solve something else, it will be a problem. We need to retrain the model and so on. So supervised learning system will be very good at classifying images of objects which has labels, but poor at classifying images of objects 
for which it has no label. So if you, for example, you want to build a machine learning model for an object detection in an image, and we need to classify it, for example, it will perform well with the, with the objects which has been labeled before. But if you have something different, it will not be able to, to classify it. But as I mentioned, in case of unsupervised, no, it will create a new class for it. And it will ask the user, in fact, it will, it will uh, inform you that we discovered a new class and you need to go to this class and try to give it a label, for example. It's the same way when you upload your images in, in Google uh, account, for example. So it will, it will tag people or it will just use this detect faces, for example, and it will ask you to tag it or label it, for example. So as powerful as supervised learning systems are, they are limited at generalizing knowledge beyond the labeled items that they have trained on. Since the majority of uh, uh, worldly data sets is unlabeled, we supervised learning's ability of AI to expand its performance to never before seen instances is quite limited. It's a problem, right? Because it will perform very bad with classes which is uh, not labeled. So supervised learning is great at solving narrow AI problems, but not so good at solving more ambitious, less clearly defined problems of the strong AI type. So you can just say that supervised learning, it's weak AI and unsupervised learning, it's a strong AI. Um, strengths and weaknesses of uh, unsupervised learning. Supervised learning will, I mean, it will perform it will, in fact, superimpose and supervised uh, learning at narrow defined tasks for which we have well defined pattern that don't, that don't change over time and for which we have sufficiently large labeled data sets. So, for example, if you are building a system to give people access to a door, for example, so you take face recognition, right, and it's, uh, the system works fine because we just build the system. This year it works fine. Maybe after five years it will not work because people are getting older, right? So for example, I mean, uh, we, we trained the, the system using images of our employees five years ago now, it's not working because faces are changing and the people, maybe they are wearing glasses, correct? Uh, maybe the hair becomes a gray and so on. So I mean, so features, face features are changing with time. So maybe in this case, the system will not be able to, uh, to work and we need to retrain those uh, models from time to time. But if it is unsupervised learning, it will still be able to, uh, to provide good performance. So instead of being guided by labels, unsupervised learning works by learning the underlying structure of the data it has trained on. After the initial training, if the unsupervised learning find images that don't belong to any of the labeled groups, it will create a separate group for the unclassified images, triggering a human to label the new um, yet to be labeled groups of images. So if, if the model discovered a new class, for example, it will trigger the user to give it a label, for example. It's the same, uh, I mean, when you, are, when you are working also with, I mean, with, with your email address, for example, sometimes you get some, uh, some emails and it will go into spam folder. Maybe it's a spam, maybe it's not spam. So you need, it's it just, it triggers the user to go and to check it, for example, and they try to give it a label, for example. If it is a spam, it will be spam. Otherwise, it will not be spam. So, but I mean, the model will be able to classify uh, new images or new classes and the trigger the user to give it a label. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, what you're saying is that with an unsupervised model, you're not actually putting in the labels, or at least not initially. You're just feeding the model a lot of data and it's just training on its own, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, this then means that you have to label the outputs later uh, in order to actually get data that's useful because otherwise it's just random, basically. Yes, I will, I will give you an example. Well, my, my question is that mm -hmm. how can, how do you know, or how can you incentivize the model to find the patterns that you want to find. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's the joke that um, you, you train an AI to, to tell the difference between, a, uh, between cats and dogs. And then you mm -hmm. show it a picture of a llama and it tells you it's a dog and you ask why. And it's because the background's green. 
Yes, um, yeah, but it, it's it's using the features. In fact, using the features, we can classify any kind of data sets using the features, not the labels, right? So I, I want to give you an example. Coins. How many coins we have in Norway? Uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, coins. On five, the four. 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 Yeah, one, five, ten, twenty. Yes, it's it's uh, five. Uh, one. Twenty. Ten and twenty. Okay, so so this is an example. I mean, uh, we have this example. We have those five coins. So I will give you a bag of coins, and I will ask you to classify it according to maybe the weight and radius, for example. Right? Is it fine? So so where you will put twenty krona? When where we will put it in this uh, place? Twenty. This one. Where should we put those twenty krona cluster, for example? So I give you if I give you a bag. And this bag has um, 100 mixed from different types of coins. So where should we keep those 20 krona? So it should be the weight will be higher and the radius will be higher. So maybe we can put those 20 krona here, right? So this one will be 20. So the class here will be 20. So all 20 kronas will be here. But of course, not all of them have the same weight. And the radius, radius also, if you will measure it correctly, not all of them will take, because after use, they will lose weight maybe or gain weight, I don't know, maybe it's are not uh, very clean. So so the, there will be slightly some difference in weight and radius. So anyway, we will put 20 krona here. Where is 10 krona? 10 krona, it's uh, maybe 10 krona. Unfortunately, they will be linear, right? Because it's, uh, anyway, so we will put 20 krona here, 10 krona. So we will have here 10 krona. Maybe also we will have five krona here. It's linear, I'm, I'm sorry, because I'm putting it as, as linear. So this one, it's five krona. Maybe one krona will be, I don't know if it could be something like here, for example. Yeah, so this is one krona. So in fact, now I give you a bunch of uh, a bunch of coins without any label. I didn't ask you, we didn't use labels, right? And I just maybe uh, um, in a blind way, you just uh, cover your eyes and you just try, okay, I will weigh them and I try to measure the uh, thickness and the width, for example. And I will classify them into, into even uh, you close your eye and you can do it correctly, right? Because you will do it by weight and radius. So this is unsupervised learning. I didn't tell you that this one is 20. You didn't read anything. You didn't look into it and say, okay, this is 20, it will be here. This is 10, it will be here. No, you just used some features and those features are the weights and the weight and radius of each coin. And you can just put it in the graph. So it will be like this one. So at the end we have, one cluster here, we will have many coins here because the width is not weight is not the same. Even if you measured it, there will be some difference. So 20 krona will be in that location, 10 krona it will be in that location, five krona it will be in that location, and one krona it will be in that location, for example. Right? So now we are classifying it without labels. So this is a kind of unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning, in fact, we use uh, features to classify images, right? But this isn't really my question. My question is more, mm -hmm. let, let's say that I'm blindfolded and you give me a bag of coins and mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of coins they are, but you're telling me to sort them. I could sort them based on, well, I, I can't see them, but I could conceivably sort them based on color. I could sort them based on the thickness. I could sort them based on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. How do you know and ensure that I sort them in a way that leaves each category mutually exclusive? For example, the the if you look at actual coins, the radius of a five krona coin is about the same as of a twenty. Mm -hmm. So how can and so and the weight be, is about the same as well. So so it would be the weight. So we will try to find any feature to make make uh, make things different, right? So maybe if they have the same uh, radius, but the but weight would be different. Does this go under under uh, data? Uh, data manipulation then so you, you're manipulating the data you, you're processing the data before you feed it to the network is that what you say no saying? no no we just need some domain uh, domain experience we need some domain knowledge so if it is coin right we are classifying coins and we are classifying coins from norway and we know that in norway they have four different types of coins right so we have some domain knowledge which means i need to classify it into four classes i just need from as a domain expert to tell me how many classes he, he should expect right how many classes? So if it is dogs and the cats, how many different types of dogs and the cats, for example? 
So we will try to use those features to classifying them into four different classes, but the machine will not understand what, what is the meaning of this one, what is the meaning of this one, what is the meaning of this one. We will ask the user to go and give it a label. So after classifying it, the machine will, will, will tell you, okay, now I have four classes. Can you please go and check which one is one? Because I don't know. So you will go into it. Okay, this one is 20. So any coin will be in this region, for example, it will be 20. Any coin in this area, it will be 10 corona. Any coin will be in this area, it will be five corona, five corona right? So it will use features for classifying things. And after that, we need the domain, I mean, unsupervised learning, we need the domain experts all time. We also classify a person in the image, which you just uploaded it to Google Drive, for example. It will ask you to tag it, right? So it will discover a new person in the image and it will give you, it will ask you, to, it will trigger the user to go and try to give it a label, right? Otherwise the machine will know, it will know that this is a new cluster. I have new cluster, I have three, four new persons in the image. So it can classify them. So if you will upload 10 images, for example, or, or 20 or whatever, it will discover, okay, now we can discover one person or two, three persons, which means three classes, three new classes in my data set. And it will trigger you to go and just give a label. If you give a label for one of those, uh, I mean, um, it will be able to, to, to discover the person on all images and to classify him because you give him a label already, right? So for those coins, uh, for example, we have the weight and the radius, for example, we will classify those coins into four clusters. But after finishing this process, the machine will not understand what does it mean, this one, what does this one mean, what does this one mean? It will ask the user to go and give it a label. So you will go, okay, those set of coins which are located in this place, this one should be 20 krona. All coins which are located in that place, it will be 10 krona. All coins which are in, in that place, it will be five krona, right? So in fact, in, in unsupervised learning, we, are, we don't have any labels, right? But we use the features for doing this classification process. And we ask the user to go and give it a label, right? You will not label the whole data set. You will just give a label to each cluster, right? I think I understand a bit better, but I still don't think uh, I'm able to explain myself clearly enough, but we'll see mm -hmm. if I can find a better way to see it later. Yeah, uh, I, I just uh, tried to find an example also, but uh, also, in, I mean, in this, this spam ham emails also, it's unsupervised, in fact. So, so the machine learning, it learned from you, in fact. So when you are getting some emails from different, some specific domains, for example, uh, it will be able by itself to say, okay, this is a spam. In some cases you get an email, but it, it's, she is not, I mean, the machine is not, I mean, sure if it is a spam or ham, for example. So it will ask you to help her. I found this new cluster here. Is it still spam or is it ham? So you need to go and just click, okay, this one is spam. So it will block all emails from that uh, domain, for example. So it uses, in fact, some features from the image uh, from, I mean, for example, uh, we, we will have an example today for uh, classifying, for example, IRIS dataset. IRIS dataset, we used supervised. We classified it as, um, as a supervised problem. We will repeat it today, in fact, as unsupervised problem. And we will see, right? So uh, just for an example for supervised algorithms, we have artificial neural network. Feed forward the neural network, it's supervised because we have some inputs and we have some labels. We use those labels for calculating the error and we use the error to adjust the weights. So it's supervised. We have also an algorithm which is called the KNN. KNN, it's key, key nearest neighborhood, key nearest neighborhood. This key nearest neighborhood, it's a very simple algorithm and it works like this one. If you have, uh, you have, for example, a data set, we have two, uh, two classes, for example, we have a, a red one and the, green, and the blue one, for example. So we have two classes, right? Uh, so it has a label, so it's a supervised because I just said this one, it's a blue one and this one, it's a red one. This one, it's a, it's a, um, it's a 20 krona, this one, it's 10 krona. So we have two classes, we have labels. So those data, they came from supervised data set with labels and we got a new example here, the green one, right? So the green, we got the green one here. So the green one, we need to decide, is it blue or is it red, right? 
So key, near, key nearest neighborhood, it will just calculate the distance between this new example, the distance between this new example and all my data points. We will measure the Euclidean distance, for example, right? We will measure the Euclidean distance and we will sort it in um, descending order. So we have, we measure the distance between the new example and all, all my data points. We will sort it in descending order. And after that, we will pick the key nearest, key nearest uh, examples or neighbors, key nearest neighbors. And we will vote for, uh, we will vote for, um, I mean, for, for the cluster, for example, for the, uh, so, so for example, if K equals three, we will look for the, 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 the nearest three, um, uh, nearest three neighbors. And we will see the majority of vote. If it is blue, this green one will be blue. If it is red, this one must be red. So this is called the key nearest neighborhood. So KNN, in fact, it looks at K number, which is integer number of nearest labeled points and the vote on how to label the new point. The new point will take the label of the majority, in fact. So, so in the example that you have here, for example, you mm -hmm. have the, the green one, let's say the K equals three, then the blue, the red, and the red would be the mm -hmm. nearest neighbors. The red would have two votes, the blue would have one vote, and so yes. the green would be classified as, as red. red. Yes, okay. correct. Um, so it's it's a very simple one, in fact, and it's a kind of lazy algorithm because it, it it's, an, it's computationally inefficient algorithm because each time we need to calculate the Euclidean distance between the new example and all data points. So we need, to, in our memory, in fact, we need to keep all examples in our uh, database, for example, or, or the memory, for example, we need to keep all those examples because each time, if I got a new data point here, for example, so imagine that I got a data point here, I need to keep all examples. So I got one here, which is a green point or something. So I will calculate the distance to each data point, right? And I will sort those into descending order and I will find the nearest, for example, nearest uh, three values. Maybe the nearest three values are those. We will vote. So when we vote, we will see that we have three blue and zero red. So this one will be blue. So the problem here, in fact, is that we need to keep all data points all time with us, which might not be possible because, I mean, for privacy, for GDPR, for example, might, might be impossible to keep the data point in your computer, for example. So, um, so KNN, in fact, it's a classify new data point. Uh, it needs more time to scan all data points and the more memory to store and to sort all data points. It performs poorly when the number of observations and features grow and they become computationally inefficient. The number of neighbors in KNN is hyperparameter that you need to choose at the time of building your model. So we need to select, I mean, K is hyperparameter. So we need to select K by ourselves, right? So we need to choose K. What, what value of K? Could be five, it could be, it should be odd number, of course, because when it's odd number, it will be easy to, to classify because we will not have a case where we have um, equal number of votes, for example. So when K equal uh, should be, for example, one, K equal should be three, five, seven, and so on. If we have two classes, if we have three classes, it will be more complex, in fact. So it will be more, more complex. But you could reasonably use K nearest neighbors for multiple classes as well, couldn't you? If you just yes, use a, yes. a co-prime number as K, I suppose. Yeah, so, so if you have three classes, for example, you can just... Uh... If you use something co-prime with, co, co with three classes, such as five, mm -hmm. uh, that would work fine. It will work fine, yes, correct. Mm -hmm. So, so this, this algorithm, it's very simple, but they call it, it's a lazy algorithm because it doesn't need any training data point for model generation or not building a model. In fact, we just need to decide the, the K and it's an approach where we calculate the Euclidean distance between the new point and all my data points, sort them in descending order and, uh, and offer that uh, calculate votes for each class. So it's, it's just calculations. In fact, it's, it's, it, it requires more calculations and um, computationally, it's in inefficient because each time we need to calculate those Euclidean distance. If it is in two-dimensional space, it will be easy. If it is multi-dimensional, higher dimensional space, it will be more complex. So complexity will increase with the number of dimensions, the number of classes, for example. So it will be it will be very tough. And and the most problem here, the biggest problem from my point of view, we need to keep all those examples in our computer. 
which is a problem. Because if you are working with a data set from a bank, for example, it's impossible to keep uh, information of clients in your computer, right? Maybe it's impossible, it's, it's dangerous. If it is for, uh, for patients, for example, from hospital and uh, critical information, so it's impossible to keep those examples or those information in my computer because we need to keep all those data points in our computer. And also when we are getting a new example, we need to keep this new example with us. So in fact, it will, I mean, maybe the need for memory, it will increase with, uh, with time and uh, computationally it's not efficient. But if you are working with feed forward neural network, once we train this model, we will have a set of weights. Once we train the model, we will just have a set of weights and we don't need to keep the data set with us, right? So if you will go for KNN, we need to keep all these data points with us. But if you will go for feed forward neural network, once we trained our model, we can just delete all data points which are used for uh, training our model, right? We don't need to keep the data. So it will be more safe, in fact. So it will be more, more safe. If you want to implement this system in, 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 uh, in a portable device, for example, it would be very complex because we need a memory. We need to keep all those data points. We need to do lots of calculations. But in case of feed forward neural network, it would be much easy because we just need to keep those vector or this matrix, omega matrix and DV matrix, for example. This is the most important, we need to keep it. In addition to that, calculations, in fact, when we deploy it in real life applications, it will be much easier and it will be more efficient for neural network because of this parallel uh, computations. So for example, if you have an image here, it will just decide this one zero, this one one, right? But here it will be more complex. We need to do more, uh, more calculations before deciding if this one should be zero or should be one. So for example, if you build a system for an autonomous car, for example, so we need to get images from, from in front of the car, for example, and they classify it. This one road, this one tree, this one car, this one bus. It will be impossible to use KNN because KNN will take more time for making decisions and classifying. But for feed, for feed forward the neural network, even if it is deep learning, it will be just very quick. You just feed it with the raw data or a video, video or images, frames, and it will make decisions very, very quickly. So it can be used in autonomous driving, for example, and so on. But in case of KNN, it's, in, it's a lazy algorithm and it's an efficient effect. Yes. Uh, so, so how KNN works, it's just a simple, we need to define K. We need to, um, I mean, if K equal one, for example, for this example, we have a data point, we will calculate the distance between this new point and all other points, and we will sort them in descending order, and we will collect the votes for uh, key, nearest, um, key nearest neighbors, for example. So if K equal one, we will see what is the nearest uh, class, for example, and then we will give it uh, the same level here. So we can, we can classify a new example. If k equal, for example, three, so we will look for three. If k equal seven, we will look for seven and so on. So we calculate the Canadian distance, we sort, and after that we vote for a majority uh, vote or a majority class, for example, and we just label the new example. So it's it's very simple. I did KNN, in fact, for iris data set. I did it for iris data set. Of course, I, I did for k equal one and the k equal five and the k equal nine. And the, I got the best results for k equal five. So the accuracy was 95%. Uh, this is how can we, because k it's, k it's a hyperparameter and when it's a hyperparameter, maybe it's by trial and error or we need to try different values and select the one which gives, which give us the best results. Do you have similar problems with uh, with overfitting with K and N as you do with A and N or similar? Yes, yes, we have overfitting. So if K is small, for example, if K equal one, for example, so it will overfit your data set. Because uh, I, can, I can explain it here, for example. So imagine, imagine uh, for this example, do you see this example? If K equal one, it will be classified as red. But if you selected K equal seven or five, maybe, so maybe it will be classified as, as blue, as, uh, as green, class P. So when K equal one, in fact, it will just try to overfit the data and it will be classified according to the nearest, nearest example. Maybe it's not correct in real life that this one belongs to the red 
class, for example, it should naturally belongs to the class B, but because of uh, K equal one, it will just overfit your data set and it will be classified as red. So when, when the data set is, when you have some kind of overlap, you need to increase the value of K to, to get more robust, uh, uh, I mean, performance. But when, when K is small, it will overfit your, your data set. It will be classified according to the nearest one, for example. They call it key nearest neighbor, not key nearest neighborhood or neighbors. It will be key nearest neighbor. And it will overfit your data set, especially when you have a kind of overlapping between classes. So here I did it for k equal one. Uh, I got different solutions when I'm running it here, but we should not get different solution in fact, right? So for example, when k equal five, uh, maybe this solution is for different k, maybe. In fact, I don't remember, but because also here I, I, I divided my data set using, um, I, I divided the data set uh, using um, train, train test split. And in train test split, it shuffles the data set each time. So maybe each time, it shuffle it in different way, for example. So, but but using a key nearest neighborhood, we should get the same results. Decision boundary. I mean, the decision boundary. You know how we how we plot the decision boundary, right? We did that before. So we use grid. Uh, we create a grid, and we just to classify each point. We we have here a point, and if k equal one, for example, so we will find the nearest nearest uh, neighbor, and it will be classified into this label and so on. So uh, the points in the middle here. So if k equal one, we will see what, what is the closest one. Is it blue or is it uh, green, for example? And it will be labeled according to this one. So, uh, so here, in fact, I, I just tested it uh, using, um, using X train and Y train. I divided the data set into one for training and one for testing. And um, I used the k equal five, for example and uh, we got different uh, results. Yeah. I guess I... Uh... So, so this approach, KNN, it's a supervised learning. So we studied KNN, for example, and we studied feed forward the neural network. We know the difference. KNN, it's a lazy algorithm, which means we need big memory, we need lots of calculations to make decisions. But in case of artificial neural network, it's much smart, much better in fact, because once we train the model, we don't need to keep the data. So you can train your model and after that, we don't need to keep those uh, huge gigabytes of data in our computer because it will be very tough. Because the uh, with the artificial neural network, when you've trained that, you just have a, a, a fairly simple, uh, a fairly simple equation that you just plot in your variables in, right? Yes, we use error back propagation for adjusting the weights. And once we adjusted the weights and once we happy, we are happy with the performance of uh, the neural network, we can just say, okay, now we will stop training and now we will deploy it. We will go into production and we will implement it in our autonomous car, in our quadcopter, for example. So we don't need to keep all those data points which has been used for training our model, right? But in case of KNN, you need to keep the whole data set with you all time. Why would you ever use KNN then over ANN? Um, why do we need to use KNN? Yeah, why if if artificial neural networks are much better at being computationally efficient, why would you want to use KNN? Like, what's the what's the boon of using KNN over ANN? No, I mean those algorithms have been developed maybe before artificial neural network. I don't know the history. In fact, when they invented this KNN, for example. But its approaches, I mean, it's, it's long history. I mean, to, to work today with those artificial neural network, it takes uh, maybe many years, in fact, maybe 40, 50 years to develop those tools. So maybe at the time also, they have been thinking that we need to find an algorithm which is efficient. So it's as a progress, I mean, how, how things are, um, I mean, developed. So this is more history than actual useful. Yes, yes. of course. Things. Yeah, because KNN, I mean, there is no reason, in fact, to use KNN but it's just an algorithm which has been developed at some point. And now we are using artificial neural network, maybe computationally, maybe at some point it was, it was more efficient than artificial neural network, maybe 20 years ago, for example. But today, I mean, there is no need to use KNN, but it's just an example of those uh, supervised learning algorithms. 
So artificial neural network is supervised, and there are also many other algorithms which are supervised, similar to KNN. Yes. So I, I implemented this algorithm, in fact, to iris dataset. So if you want to do it for, you can try. I mean, you can, you can try to play with uh, with um, with MNIST, for example, or any other example, and try to see what is the difference. Yeah, I mean those. Uh, I mean the plot here. It's for the test set, right? For the test set, and you can get the accuracy. So. I mean, you have this code, you can just go to the code and try to play with this uh, one, try to make it more fancy, try for different key values and so on. Yes. So um, in unsupervised algorithms, because I mean, the idea today is to try to work with some unsupervised learning algorithms. We talked before about BCA, and the BCA, it's unsupervised and it's used for dimensionality reduction. I mean, BCA, in fact, it's a block. We have set of input X, and then we will get here another X, another set of features X dash, for example. But those X dash, in fact, it's it's the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, and it's sorted in descending order according to the eigenvalues. So you can pick the top 100, the top 10, the top 20, for example, principal components. And you can use those 100 values or 10 values, principal components, for training your model. So, so BCA, it's uh, based on statistics. And it's used for dimensionality reduction. And it's useful for, for machine learning, because instead of building a more complex model, we can just build a simple model using those very um, uh, superior features for training our model and solving it. And when the model is more simple, we will have better chances to avoid overfitting, for example. So, so BCA, it's a very important tool. And once you uh, have this reduced set, so I can, this is the original set of features. This is the original set. And we will get the same, uh, a, a different set, in fact. We call it eigenvectors. For example, it has the same size as X, in fact. But we can pick maybe the first 20 principal components. And you can use those 20 uh, components, principal components, for reconstructing the image. So we can have an image here. We can convert it into the eigenvectors. We can pick maybe the top 20, for example. We can use those top 20 for reconstructing the image one more time. I guess we did that before. And after that, we will talk about um, clustering algorithm, which is key means the clustering. Key means the clustering is very important algorithm in unsupervised learning, very, very important. And after that, we will talk about autoencoders. We can use autoencoders for feature extraction and also for dimensionality reduction, denoising. So there are many functions for autoencoders. So the autoencoders also, it will work similarly to the uh, principal component analysis. We have a set of features. We can get a reduced set of features using autoencoder. So we train an autoencoder to, uh, to, to code uh, an original uh, set of features into a, a small set or a reduced set of features. So it works in a similar way to BCA, but of course, autoencoder, it's feed forward the neural network, right? So it has non-linearity and it's maybe it's more efficient than BCA in fact. But of course it takes time for training it. And then when we build the autoencoder, we can use uh, the first part, which is the encoder for encoding the original features into a subset of features. We will we will see it today. So key means the clustering. I mean BCA. I will not talk about BCA because we talked about it before. So it's unsupervised learning, which you try to learn the underlying structure of a data set that does not have labels. So we are not using we are not working with labels. We are, we are working only with features, and therefore we call it unsupervised learning. We use it for the uh, we use it for dimensionality reduction. So it projects higher dimensional input data to a low dimensional space, filtering out the not so relevant features and keeping as much as of the interesting ones as possible. So in fact, we convert my feature space into a lower um, feature space, and we use those um, uh, uh, lower feature space for building uh, our model and the visualization as well. Dimensionality reduction allows AI to be more efficient in solving a larger scale and the computationally expensive problems, which involve images, videos, speech, and text, correct? 
because if you are working, I mean, BCA, we can use it for compression, also data compression, correct? Because I can have an image. This image may be the size is uh, just an example, 28 times 28 for MNIST data set, which means I have 874, 784 pixel values. If you can use BCA, for example, we can convert those um, 784 feature values into maybe a set of 100. So in this case, I can use 100 for training my model instead of using 700 features. So it will reduce the complexity of my model. And, and for, for compression, for example, we are compressing the image into, into, uh, into a code, which can be used for reconstructing it one more time, by the way. So it's like for data compression, for visualization, uh, to help us to have, uh, to, to, to work with large scale and computationally expensive problems if we can reduce the set of features so we can get the most efficient, most relevant features to work with. BCA identifies which features out of the full set of features are most important in explaining the variability in the data set and filter out the features that are less useful in explaining the data set. So in fact, we, we try, I mean, using BCA, we try to find the principal components, which is the eigenvector. And the second uh, one, the second principal component would be perpendicular to this one. So maybe this is my data set. So the first eigenvector, it is the eigenvector where we have uh, the most of uh, variations, the highest variation, for example, it would be like this one. So this is the first component, this is the second component, and so on. So I can just select the first component because it explains a lot of variations in the direction of. Um, yes. So we had we had lots of examples in BCE. I mean, in the last uh, maybe five six weeks, we have lots of examples in BCE. So please go to those examples, and we had an example where we used the BCE for. Uh, reducing a uh, number of uh, features in MNIST. And we trained we trained a model for the full set and for a reduced set. And we cannot see big difference in fact. So there is no big difference in accuracy. Key means the clustering. Um, key means clustering, it's unsupervised learning algorithm. So it, it should be, it should be uh, we should use it for classifying, I mean, classifying a, a data set, for example. So with key means the clustering, we specify the number of desired clusters. We specify, this is the knowledge which, which I told you about, domain knowledge. We need to decide how many clusters we need. So if you are working with coins, uh, we know that it's K should equal four, for example. If you are working with MNIST data set, we know, I mean, by, by knowledge and experience that we should have 10 clusters. Correct? So we need to specify how many clusters, correct? To speed up uh, this clustering process, key means randomly assigns each observation to one of the key clusters, and then begins to reassign those observations to minimize the Euclidean distance between each observation and its cluster center point. I mean, we we'll start by centroids. We define uh, centroids, K centroids. We pick K values or K examples from the data set by random. And we say, okay, this is a centroid. So those are the centers of the K clusters, which we are looking for. And after that, uh, calculate the Euclidean distance between each point and those centers and update the centers. So I have this example. It's the same example. We have X1 and X2 from Iris data set. We have three classes, right? Uh, so this is my data set, but this one for the testing data set, in fact, right? So uh, how the algorithm works, in fact, we, we, we decide how many clusters we need. So I used this one from SDK Learn. So we need, to we need to decide how many clusters, number of clusters. So we select K equals three, for example. And um, if K equals three, we will pick, we will, we will select three data points as, as three centroids. And after that, we will calculate the Euclidean distance between each data point. We will go for the first data point, for example, this one. We will calculate the Euclidean distance between this point and this center, and this center and this center. We can see that this one, it's a closer to this one, right? So this one will be assigned to this cluster. And we will, we will update the centroid. So now the centroid will, will go to the distance to the, will be the average between those two points. So the centroid will move to the average here. We will go to the second data point 
imagine it's this point. We will calculate the distance between Euclidean distance between this point and all centers. We will sort this in descending order. So this one will be assigned to this cluster because it's closer to this one. And we will, we will update the centroid here. So it will be the average between the old center and the new data point and so on. We will do this one until no more changes will, will happen. So at the end, we got three centroids. We got one center here, we got one center here, and we got one center here, right? So we have three center points. If you got a new example, if you got a new example, you want to test it, for example. So if, imagine that I got an example here. This is new example, which is rectangle. I will just calculate the Euclidean dis distance between this data point and the three center centers or centroids. And I will, I will assign it to the closest one. So if this one, it's closer to this one, it will be green. If this one closer to this one, it will be blue. If it's closer to this one, it will be brown. So this is how key and, and uh, key means the clustering works. After, I mean, after uh, training our model, we will get three values, the center points. So this one, it's much better than key in, in effect because also here we don't need to keep the data points. We don't have any weights, but we will have three center points. So after training this one, we will have centroids and those centroids, it will be three, it will be a vector of three values. So it will be, I call it C1, C2 and C3, for example, and this is X and Y. So I will have three center values or three centroids. If you have any data point, you want to test it, you want to classify it, we will just calculate the Euclidean distance between this point and the three centers. We will sort it or we will assign it to the nearest one. So if for the example of coins, for example, I will collect lots of coins. We will find the center of 20 corona, it will be located here. The center of 10 corona, it will be located here. Uh, five corona and one corona, it will be here and there, right? We got a new, a new coin, which I don't know. So I will just calculate the distance between Euclidean distance between this new example and the four centroids. And we will assign it to the closest one. So if it is closer to one corona, it will be one. If it is closer to 10 corona, it will be 10. If it is closer to 20 or five, it will be. So this is how key and uh, key means the clustering works. So key means the clustering, it's unsupervised learning because here we are not working with labels. We are working with with the features. So after training your model, you need to give it a label. For example, you can say, okay, this is a centroid of 20 corona. This is a centroid of 10 corona. This is a centroid of one corona, for example, right? So you need to give it a label because any example, it would be correctly classified, but you need to give it a label. You can just say, you will get the centers of class one, class two, class three. This is all information which the machine knows about the problem, but it doesn't know what is the meaning of class one? What is the meaning of class two? What is the meaning of class three? In this example in Iris here, it's, it's one it, it called, um, um, I mean, we have three clusters, I don't remember names, uh, Versicolor, uh, Virginica, and um, I don't remember the other one. Setosa. Huh? Setosa. Setosa. Yeah, so, so we have Setosa. One will be Setosa, for example, one will be uh, Versicolor, the other one will be Virginica. But in fact, the machine will not understand which one is one. But it will just tell you that we have three clusters. This is the centroid of the first one, the second one, the third one. You need to go by yourself and give it a label. This is a centroid of Virginica. Any point which is closer to Virginica, it will be Virginica. Any point which is closer to uh, Cetosa, it will be classified as Cetosa. So this is how unsupervised learning works. So the machine here is not told that these parameters are for this uh, this class. It's just giving all of the data with none of the target features and yes. then trained on that to find a user specified number of clusters. Yes. Is KMC actively used now or is it like KMN just uh, No, no, KMN is, K means the clustering is very important algorithm. In fact, they are using it in Facebook, for example. Sometimes you get some recommendations uh, with your friends. So sometimes you get those recommendations from Facebook, right? They propose friends to you, correct? Sure. How do they do it? 
and in LinkedIn, sometimes you, you, you see that someone is bobbing up that he is closer to you, you need to send him a request or something in Facebook account also. So they try to, uh, so, so they use features in fact, and they calculate the Euclidean distance between you and those other examples. And when they see that there is one who is closer to you, they can just recommend him to you as a friend, for example. So you can just, they propose it to you uh, that this one has the same background, maybe the same educational background, the same hobbies, because each one has a profile and this profile is defined with lots of features in fact, right? So it's a multi entire dimensional space and, and it's unsupervised because we don't know which one, I mean, he is a new cluster, he is a new person, but they try to calculate Euclidean dis distance between you and the many people. And when someone is closer, they can just recommend him to you, for example. Uh, in Amazon, for example, when you buy a book, I buy a book in machine learning and in the next week, they will send you recommendations for similar titles. How they do it in fact, because uh, they, when we have an account in Amazon also, uh, we, they, they just try to have a record of our history and they try to have a profile and this profile is defined with some features. For example, in education, I, I like to read books in machine learning. So they will try to calculate the Canadian distance between, uh, I mean, my wish list, for example, and uh, new titles. And they can just recommend, okay, this one is you. If you like music, you will get different different recommendations by the system. So it's totally unsupervised. So key means the clustering, it's very, very important algorithm in fact, very, very important. It's one of the most powerful and one of the most famous uh, algorithms in uh, unsupervised algorithms. And it's used today in fact, those recommendation systems, it's, it's uh, so for example, you are traveling to some places in summertime and you will just get, I mean, we are using uh, booking.com, for example, or those websites. So they know that you like to travel to those locations. So if they got some offers, they can just find the distance and they recommend those places to you because they are expecting that they will like you. Uh, you will like those uh, destinations, for example. So they use a, a key, nearest, a key means of clustering, in, in fact, for doing this. So it's the Euclidean distance between me, between my features, and the features of other people. So we can find that we have common interest if both of us like football, if both of us watch games in a football stadium, for example. So they can send a recommendation for us to buy sports um, clothes, for example, and uh, stuff like this, because there are some similarity between both of us, for example. So they can, they can measure the distance between our two profiles. So K, in, K means the clustering is very, very important algorithm. And even an expert system, because we should study expert system, in fact, in expert system, expert system, it's based on, it's rule-based system. And, and the building those rules, in fact, it's very complex because we need to extract those rules from a domain expert. So if I need to build an expert system for a banking system, I need to go to the bank, understand the problem, uh, work with the people in the bank and try to extract those knowledge uh, as rules, right? Which is very tough, very, very tough in fact, because maybe um, if you are in good mood, you will work hard, you will get very good rules from the people who are working in the bank and you will build a good system. But how can we automate this process? How can we work with data? So imagine that the guy who was doing this job, he has died, for example, he got, he was died in an accident, for example, And but we have his computer, we have the Excel files, which he, which he has been using for 10, 20 years, for example. So one way for building those knowledge from the data using in, 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 key means clustering, in fact. So we can extract the rules from the data using key means clustering. So key means clustering is very, very important. important language. And there are lots of versions. I mean, the one which we are presenting here, maybe it's the simplest one, but there are lots of versions, in fact, from this uh, one. It's key means the clustering, if the key means the clustering, I mean, there are lots of variations, in fact, of uh, this algorithm. But maybe this is one of the most simple uh, algorithms. So the, this algorithm, it's a very simple, but it's a very efficient because after training the model, we will have the centroids, right? And once we have the centroids, we can just classify any point, right? So, um, so in this code, in fact, we also use um, key means from sklearn, key means from sklearn.cluster. We need to specify number of clusters. This is very important. 
and um, maybe it's it's auto means it says maybe it's the Euclidean distance and random seed for example we need to select random seed and we use the x I, I mean in feed forward the neural network when we fit a model we use x train and y train because this one it's unsupervised we use only x train right and after that we can print the centroids centers of of the the clusters the three clusters so we should get here uh, centers of k, k clusters and just the plotting it I trained it and I got accuracy of 91%. But maybe if you can train it more, if you can um, maybe use different, uh, I mean, you can tune this model to get maybe better results. But but at the end also the accuracy is 91% and it's unsupervised, do you see? Unsupervised. But remember here that the model will classify your data into three classes, but it will know nothing about those three classes in fact. So, you need to go by yourself and just say, okay, this one is a centroid of Cetosa. This one, it's a centroid of Versicolor and so on. So you need to specify, you need to give it a name or tag it, in fact. Yes. Uh, so what is left for us today, it's the autoencoder. So um, do you like to take a break, for example, or? Uh, So we have today, it's only the uh, autoencoder and uh, maybe we will stop at that point. So do you have any questions so far? How does the, uh, so if, you, if you're looking at the, um, the k-means clustering right there that you have uh, drawn up, the red and the green classes are somewhat overlapping. How does the algorithm decide which is which? I mean, it should be based on the distance, in fact, right? So it should be based. So I don't know. Maybe when we are plotting it, we are not plotting. Um, uh, maybe it looks like it's as a green point. Maybe this one looks like closer to this one here, right? Some point looks closer to this one, but maybe plotting. I, I don't know when I plot it, uh, if I uh, try to make it, um, you know, when we are plotting, uh, sometimes we, do you understand me? No, not really, no. No, maybe the distance is actual distance is because, uh, because the Euclidean distance here, it's a square root. It should be like X minus X1, X minus uh, uh, X, um, X is zero, uh, X minus X is zero square plus y minus y zero square, right? Because it's in two dimensional space. So maybe it looks like closer to this point, but maybe it's not realistic. Maybe it's not the Euclidean distance. So we need to measure the Euclidean distance of those examples and to see really if those examples are closer to this one or not. But of course I, I, I trust the algorithm. So, <laughs> so when, when we, are plotting maybe when we are plotting it's uh, the, the axes are not in the actual dimension maybe you, you need to do it in uh, maybe you can try to plot it in different uh, way for example because those points here if you can look here it's, it's in the it's uh, i mean the decision boundary here it's on the border in fact those points are located on the border right so uh no 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 sorry sorry uh, no, this is the points which may be misclassified, right? Because I'm, I'm labeling it according to the, um, the testing data set. So you're labeling them uh, accurately. The, these are the actual classes. These are not the classes as given by the algorithm. Yes, yes, because the accuracy here is 91%. And I have maybe some classes are, some, uh, some examples are misclassified, correct? Because okay. I'm, do I'm doing this one for, for the testing set. Yeah, so the, the drawn points there are the testing points, not the training points. No, 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 it's a testing point. Okay. So maybe some some points are misclassified, right? Some points here in the border are misclassified. So when, when, when we have this overlap, it will be really problematic. So... Um, So in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm testing, uh, do you see here the 
accuracy also accuracy score i used i used y test here for testing the accuracy of the algorithm so i i can predict for x test i can predict um uh, for for x test i can predict in which which class class one two three for example and after that i have y predict and y test and i can get the accuracy so the accuracy it's 91 percent which means we have like nine percent uh, misclassified uh, cases so maybe those are the cases which are misclassified right using this algorithm Yes. Um, so, so the autoencoder it's also unsupervised learning, and the autoencoder it's very simple and it's exciting, in fact, because the autoencoder it's unsupervised algorithm, and it consists of two parts. The first part we call it encoder, and the second part we call it decoder. And in the middle here we have something they call it bottleneck, or the code, in fact. This code, it's in fact, it's com compressed representation of the original input or the original image. And uh, the autoencoder, in fact, it's supervised because we don't have any labels, in fact. So the input will be the original image and the output also will be the original image or a constructed image. So the encoder, in fact, it will convert the original image into a code and the decoder will reconstruct the image using this compressed code or compressed representation. And it's a feed forward neural network. So it could be one layer here and one layer here. And in the bottle, we have the code. In the middle, we have the code. Or it could be deep. So it can be a um, simple autoencoder or it can be deep autoencoder. When it's deep, it means we have more than one layer. So this part here, it's this is the encoder. And this part here, it's the decoder. So we use the original image here to um, we use the original image as input, and also, in fact, we have the original image as an output. So we train it using X-train and X-train. Uh, I mean, when, when usually, when we are working with a model for classifying, we fit the model into X and Y. No, this one, we fit it using X and X, because the input will be X and the output will be X. In this case, in fact, the first part, which is the encoder, it will learn how to compress the data into this code. And the decoder will try to reconstruct. It will learn how to reconstruct the original image using this coded version or the compressed representation of the image. Does that mean that would you usually train the encoder and the decoder as two separate networks? No, use... only one, only one. Yes, if you want to do it separately, it, it should be fine by the way, right? But, but why should we do it like this? We so build... can you use the encoder just in reverse as the decoder? Yes. So 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 the decoder, in fact, uh, reverse. What do we mean? Well, if you look at the uh, the figure that you have above there on the right mm -hmm. side, you have the what looks like some sort of algorithm to get from the input to the code, mm -hmm. and then at least if the the colors and the shapes are to be trusted, then it looks like you have the same steps but taken in reverse to get the output. Yes, correct, correct. Yes, you are right. Uh, do you know why? Because because I need to use error back propagation here to adjust the weights. And if you want to adjust the weights, I need to reconstruct the image one more time and subtract this reconstructed image from the original image to create this reconstruction error. And I will use this reconstruction error for adjusting the weights, right? So when we go forward, when we go forward, I mean, the main task, in fact, it is an encoder. For me, the most important part is the first part, which is the encoder, because I want to use it as a principal component analysis, for example. I want to uh, use it for compressing, compressing, sorry, compressing my data. I need to get the code. So the most important for me is the code. How can we get the code? We need to get the code uh, from the encoder. So I want to train the encoder. But how can I, I train the encoder? I will train the encoder by adding the decoder also. So the decoder will use the code to reconstruct the image, reconstructed image minus the original image. We will have an error. We will call it reconstruction error. I will use this reconstruction error in the backward to adjust the weights. So this is how we will train our autoencoder.
Is, is it okay? So in fact, in this autoencoder, we have the input image. We will use this input image to uh, get uh, a, a compressed, compressed representation of the image, right? Which we call it the code. And after that, the decoder will use the code to reconstruct the image one more time. Once we reconstructed it, it will not be exactly as the, as the input image. There will be some difference, correct? So the difference between this reconstructed image and the original image, we call it reconstruction error. We will use this reconstruction error for adjusting the weights. It will be the signal which will be used for adjusting the weights. Once we trained our encoder, we will slice it and we will take the first part for, uh, for, for image compression. If I want to compress, compress my image into a code, I will use the first part for doing this dimensional reduction, right? So in this case, if I have m nested data set here, I will compress it into maybe 10 values or 16 values or 32 values, for example. So we will compress it into, into a code and we will use this code for building the classifier, right? So in fact, if you are building a feed forward neural network to classify m nested data set, I can put in front of it this encoder. So the encoder will get the original image. It will compress it into the code and I will use those code for as an input to my classifier. So in this case, we compress. So in this case, we will guarantee that I have a model which is really simple and it will not overfit because the number of fits will be much, much less. So, so the autoencoder, it's a specific type of feed-forward neural network where the input um, is the same as the output. They compress the input into a lower dimensional code and then reconstruct the output from this representation. We reconstruct the output one more time. So the code is a compact summary or compression of the input. So the autoencoder consists of three components, encoder, code, and decoder. And the encoder compresses the input and produces the code and the decoder reconstructs the input again using the code. Autoencoders learn a new representation of the original input data using the encoder to minimize the reconstruction error. So this is the task here. We, we need the decoder, in fact, to create the error signal reconstruction error, right? Because if you want to train only the first part, how can we train it? Because I don't have a code. I don't have a code, in fact, correct? We don't have any code. Because if, if we need to train a feed forward in the neural network, we need to get the error signal. How can I get the error signal if I, if I want to train the first part alone? So in fact, we reconstruct again because I need to find an, a reconstruction error. How can we get the reconstruction error? The construction error will be the difference between the reconstructed image and the original image. So that is why we, we have the decoder. But in reality, after implementation, after training our encoder, we will take the first part, which is the encoder, and put it in our system, uh, because this is the part which we are interested in, in fact. Uh, the autoencoder, it's data specific. So when we build an autoencoder for MNIST, we cannot use it for Olfetti, for example. I mean, the Olfetti data set, which I shared with you, you can use also autoencoder for reducing it, right? So if I build a system for MNIST, I cannot use it for, for Olfetti, right? Because it's a data driven. I need to train an, another one for another data set and so on. <clears throat> and it's unsupervised because because we, we don't use any labels. We just use the input, we just, we just use the input image or the features. <clears throat> and it's Lucy because the output of the autoencoder will not be exactly the same as the input. It will be a reconstructed image. And it's a similar to principal component analysis. In principal component analysis, when we reconstruct an image, it will not be exactly the same as the original image. I implemented autoencoder here for Iris and I built it using Keras. So this is the important part here. So the autoencoder, I need to use sequential EBI. So I will just call a model called autoencoder equals sequential. And I added one layer. So the first layer, I call it encoder layer. And uh, the input dimension will be 784, which is a number of pixels. This number, in fact, it's 20, 28 times 28. Because each M nested set is 28 times 28 pixels. So the number of features here, in fact, is 784 and the bottleneck will be 32 so i want to i want to reduce 
the number of features from 784 into 32. So the code will be 32, will be a vector of 32 values. And so this one will be the encoder. The decoder will do the reverse, as you mentioned. So it will it will try to reconstruct the image again. So so the, uh, the size of the output will be 784 using those 32 inputs. So we will reconstruct. So this the encoder will compress and the decoder will reconstruct. We will just compile it and we will fit my model. When we are fitting the, the model, we will just uh, we will train it using um, using X uh, train and X train, right? We don't we don't use any labels here, right? So uh, so this is the model how it will look like. We it, it has I mean this one it is the input layer. We don't care about it. This is the first layer, encoder layer, and this is the decoder layer, right? So the input will be 784. The bottleneck will be 32. The decoder will be 32 to 784. So if we need to plot it, it will be like this one. We have the bottleneck here from 1 to 32. We have here in the input, we will have a very big one from 1, 2, 3 until 784. Connects all those connections. And the decoder will be the same size. So this one will be how it will look like. So the first part here, it will be the encoder. The second part will be the decoder. So once we build this model auto encoder, we will train it using our uh, training data set. And after that, I will, I will slice it and I will take the first part for dimensional reduction after training it. And, the, and, the, and after we are happy with the uh, response, we can just using the first part for, for compressing my data, right? So because now this one will, will make life much easier, I will give it, I will feed it with the original image size and it will give me this code, right? So I can use this code in fact for training a classifier. So the classifier will be much simpler, right? So I didn't do the classifier part here, but you can do it at home, for example. So you can do it at home. So once we train the autoencoder, we will take the first part for dimensionality reduction and we will use this code for training our classifier. So uh, I just here, I just here, I, I trained the model. So when we train the model, and also I got the encoder also. So I can build, as I told you, the encoder here, it will consist of uh, only the layer, the first layer. So it will be the autoencoder first layer because the autoencoder here, it has two layers. Layer zero and layer one. Layer zero, it's the one which will compress. And layer one, it will be the one which will reconstruct. We are interested in the one which will compress, correct? So if you want to build a model, so after training your, mo your model, you want to extract the, uh, the encoder. So the encoder will be a model which will consist of uh, the first layer, right? And now I, I can just show you some results here. So this is the original image, 72104, for example. This is the encode. This, uh, this is the code, in fact, right? This one, it's the code. And this one, it's a reconstructed image. And as you can see here, there is a difference between the reconstructed image and the original image. It's not the same because, in fact, reconstructed it using the code. Right, so seven. So this is the code of seven. This is the code of two. This is the code of one, zero, four, and so on. So in this case, in fact, if you want, you can just use the first layer, the first layer, which is the encoder. So the output from this encoder, in fact, it will be just one, two, until 32. So it will be the code. We can use this in code to feed it into a model for classifying. So now I can build more simpler model, in fact, for a classifying my data set. We don't need to work with the original image. We can just work with the code. Uh, I was just wondering, how compressed is this uh, file? How can we compress? No, uh, how, how much compression is this? Is this like 95% compressed or? Yes, yes. Uh, how can, it will be, it will be, um, look, as a percentage, it will be 784 minus 32 divided by 784 
multiplied by 100. Can you multiply it, please, to see the how much percentage of compression? So I can 96 do 96%. 96? Yeah, approximately. Yes, so now we have 96% compression. Because we are compressing from uh, 784 into 32, right? So it's a 90, 96% compression. And you can reconstruct like like coding and decoding on the encryption. So if you want to send, you can just do it with your friend. For example, you want to send him a picture, for example. So you can just compress it at your home and he can reconstruct it as his home, for example. And then when you're transferring it, it, you will be sure that no one will be able to understand what is this one. Because I trained my model already and I'm using the encoder and in his side, he will be using the decoder, right? And, and they have been using this, in fact, for compressing data, because I mean, as I told you, we are collecting data around us in a certain virus. And for example, they collect, they scan all roads on the way twice per year, for example. How can they keep all those images in their computers? If it is 4K, 4K images, it will take much bigger space, much bigger area. So in this case, we can compress. And when we are also transmitting information, it will be much easier to compress and decompress. So, so the autoencoder, in fact, it's exciting and it's uh, very, very, very important. And also we can use it for denoising, in fact, right? So in fact, in the training process, maybe we can add some noise to this image. If I add a noise here. So as an input, it will be the noisy image. And the output, it will be the clean image. So I will train the autoencoder also to reconstruct the image without noise, right? To, to denoise the images. So I did, I did it in fact for uh, just a deep, deep autoencoder. When it's deep autoencoder, I just increased number of layers. So instead of using only one layer, I used the three layers here for the autoencoder and the three layers for the decoder. I call it deep autoencoder, as you call it deep autoencoder. So if, if the data set is more complex, for example, you can try this autoencoder with Olfiti data set, which I shared it with you today. You can use it with with all 50 data sets, try with one, one layer, two layers of encoder, and the six layers or eight layers deep auto encoder, for example, and you can just check the difference. Is there any difference in performance? But so, you, you are using the, um, you are using the, the perceptron learning rule or error back propagation to train the system, right? Yes, error back propagation. I mean, when it's feed forward the neural network, we cannot use perceptual learning rule. Right. No, simple. of course. But uh, when you're using then a, what is it, seven layer system, like you're saying you're using that, mm -hmm. wouldn't the error become very small? How do you actually train it? Yeah, yes, yes, you are correct. It's a problem. When it's deep, I mean, there is no way to avoid it. It's just, I'm using here RELU to make it much, um, look, when I reconstructed it, I just, used, no, I used linear, in fact, linear activation function. When it's linear, the performance will be much better. Do you, rem do you, know, do you remember linear function? So it will be like this one. When it's linear function, it's okay, right? Uh, or you can just use RELU, which, which is like this. So the impact of um, vanishing gradient will be much less. So when you go deeply, try to use different activation function. If you will go for sigmoid, Right, it will be a problem. You will see the difference. You will not be yeah, able okay. to train your encoder, but you need to select the right activation function. Right. So, because the activation function gives such a large, uh, it, it it gives a large output, it doesn't become as big of a problem. Yes, yes. The activation function. If you will use sigmoid, for example, so the first drift to calculate the gradient, so the gradient will be y times one minus y. So it's a smaller values multiplied by smaller values. It will be much smaller, and so on. So the vanishing ingredient will be a problem, in fact, if you will go for sigmoid, right? But if you will go for linear or for RELU, the impact will be much less. So you will be able to train those layers. Right? So just to try, you have the code. Try to just to try to different combinations and try to see. So this is uh, using deep, deep uh, encoder. There is no big difference, in fact, for MNIST, but you can try with Olfiti. You can try with Olfiti data set, which I shared with you today, for example. Try, is there any difference between deep autoencoder and just uh, shallow autoencoder, for example? Yes. 
so so I'm changing in fact. So do you see the difference? You just mentioned it in fact. When when we use linear here, we got this kind of images. Do you see? Still has a kind of blurring, right? And when I changed it to RELU, I changed it to RELU. Do you see? It's much better in fact, right? Which means RELU is much better. I don't know, in fact, because all image image value it's positive values, so I, I don't know why uh, why linear is not performing good as RELU, but when I changed it from linear into RELU, you have this better performance. Is there a handy way to predict that before you're using it, or is it just experimentation to find what activation function works the best? I guess it's, but but maybe look, I used here in, at the end here, I used the linear. Maybe this is a big mistake to use linear here in the last one because we need to make decisions. Maybe if we, you can please repeat this example one more time, but change this one into sigmoid to be similar to this one, right? This one is sigmoid. So we can really make good comparison because I don't know if, if the impact is from the linear function or from the RELU, the performance. So uh, just to change this one into sigmoid, change this, uh, change this one here in the last layer here into sigmoid first, and they make comparison. Maybe if you change this one into a sigmoid, maybe you will get better results here. Because I'm expecting that the performance should be the same, right? Because anyway, we are playing in that part here, we are playing here, right? But maybe the first drift, I have no idea because, because the, the gradient also here, will be a sigmoid. I mean, the gradient of this function would be a sigmoid, right? But what will be the gradient here? So uh, just experiment and try to figure out what, what, is the, what is the reason behind it, right? So for, for denoising, denoising, it's extremely simple. It's just adding Gaussian noise to the original image. You just need to add Gaussian noise to the original image. And just to train the model using the uh, noisy images and the clean image, right? So the input uh, the input will be the input will be the noisy image or the image plus Gaussian. And the target, in fact, the target will be here will be the clean image, just the image. So in fact, I train the autoencoder to try to clean my image. So when I give it an image plus a noise, he should give me the image without the noise, right? So this is the original image and this is the image plus Gaussian. And I just train the, uh, this, this uh, autoencoder to, I train the autoencoder to try to get the image without Gaussian, without noise. And, and finally, I got this nice response. So when the input is this image with noise, you will get this, right? So it's also very, very important. Because sometimes you build uh, you build a system for face recognition, which works fine in daytime. What what about in, in nighttime, right? What about when it's raining and uh, we have a kind of noise in my image, for example? What will happen? So maybe in some cases it's very very important to use autoencoder for denoising first before before sending those images into your machine learning model. It will be very very important. So using autoencoder for denoising, it will be exactly the same, no difference. It's just that when we are training our model, we need to train the model with noisy images. So with the images plus Gaussian, uh, Gaussian noise, adding a Gaussian noise to it, and it will try to predict the original one. So this is very important. It's important not only in images. In fact, it's important in many fields. So if you are working with, with text, for example, understanding, if you are working with uh, time series, for example, maybe the time series has some kind of noise. Maybe we are collecting data from a noisy source, for example. So in this case, we need to train those hot encoder to try to get rid of those noises. Maybe it will make my model confusing and uh, yes. So I guess we finished the today and um, just to please go to the examples and try to experiment. You have the code in GitHub. So please go to the slides one more time. You can do it, I mean, maybe each day you can have one slide and there's a code with it, run it, try to make changes, try to make modifications and improve your results. Maybe next time, next week, it would be the last week for this neural network part or machine learning part. And after that, we will try to work with 
and try to go into the next part with the experiment uh, expert system part. You have the uh, example. I shared the example in uh, in uh, this Ulfiti data set in, uh, in Blackboard. You can use it as a home assignment, as a first home assignment. So if you didn't submit your first home assignment, use this Ulfiti data set and then try to apply as much as possible from those methods. Try to apply BCA and train a classifier. Try to apply go to encoder and train a classifier. Uh, try to use uh, add Gaussian noise to the images and use the autoencoder to denoise the images and the train a classifier and they make comparison, just to make comparison. Uh, try to use SCGD uh, and BGD, for example, MBBGD, minimum mini patch gradient descent and so on. So try to use all those approaches. Try hold out uh, validations and the cross validation. So we learned a lot, right? So just to use one example and to try to apply all those techniques to this example, write your code in Colab, add a link to your report, send it to me, right? And I will check it and I will give you a feedback on it. So um, any questions for today? So we, we are finishing today. We will stop here. I, I just want you to go to the slides and